Uh, hello, everyone. Okay, so that was a really great miners panel, and we just have one more uh, session to go before we go to the reception. So, just um, point of information: the buses are gonna are gonna be here at 6:30 p.m. So we're gonna do the works in progress, and then we'll have a little bit of a break, but then go downstairs and find a bus at 6:30 to go to the reception. Okay. So we're gonna start uh, this session. So this is called Works in Progress. Uh, we're gonna have a, about 13 different speakers who are gonna do one, two, three, or four, or five minute talks. So this is gonna be really fast. Uh, to the speakers, I sent you the order in which you're going. When the person in front of you gets up to go, come here and stand near the stage and be ready to jump on stage. No introductions. Uh, you've got the time that you said you had, and I'm gonna ring you off stage if you go over. So we're gonna start with uh, Pindar Wong. Who's, uh, yeah, who's gonna start? Yep, whoa, thank you. So my uh, the little the spiel is gonna be about scaling, scaling Bitcoin. Okay, so what I wanted to is talk about a little bit about the design, because a lot of you asked me questions. This is all about the tech, okay? It's about the community and the tech. It's not a sales, not a marketing conference. There's no bling. The only reason why you're here is the high quality of the content. And hopefully the awesome socials. And the reason why we try to design it this way is so that we can actually replicate this notion of people getting together. Maybe not under the scaling Bitcoin banner, but if you want to get together as a community, we have written most of the stuff that if you want to go and do one of these events, you can. Right? So that's the, that's, the, that's the good news. And some of the th reasons why the design is this way is I think the observation that we're dealing with a platform tech just like the internet. And so as some of you know, I've, I created the first licensed ISP in Hong Kong uh, in 1993, and in fact, we have one of the fathers of the internet in Africa in our uh, audience today. And I think in, in, in sort of Ni Quena, if, if I don't mind calling it, yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> internet Hall of Fame. And so what we've been doing is we've been swapping notes and saying, how is, is this space different and how is it similar to the internet? Feels, I'm sorry, it feels exactly the same. Same, same energy, same vibe, the sense of mission, remember phase one? mission, not necessarily market share. We're on this to make Bitcoin scaling and scaling um, well. Now, in order to do that though, we need to uh, be able to uh, synchronize the dialogue, not centralize it. In other words, we need to you know, uh, all agree we're talking about the same thing. Uh, you probably see in our website today, that uh, yesterday, that we've got a, a Bitcoin English Chinese dictionary, right? So thanks to all the volunteers who built that. So in order to try and synchronize the dialogue, not centralize it, physical get-together meetings like Scaling Bitcoin actually help do that. Why? Because what all these little things that we're trying to do here by self-identifying reduces the synchronization costs. How can I find people who like, who, who think like me, who, or, and some who don't, obviously, but how can we self-organize to find a way to solve problems together? So we're doing this in a very basic way. We're making lots of mistakes, right? We said that even on the website, so your forgiveness. But if any of you do want to uh, run an event sort of along these lines, please uh, contact us. Again, we've only sort of two phases. But here's a question for you in closing, which is we set this up as a two-phase only event. Phase one, phase two, that's it. So think about, um, obviously, whether or not these events are um, useful. Why? Because in closing tomorrow, in the wrap-up, I'm going to be asking you to basically hum and basically say whether or not you feel that phase one and phase two have been technically useful. Obviously, the community stuff is great. Don't get me wrong, I love you guys. Yeah. But at the same time, we have to move forward technically and make sure that Bitcoin has the best tech. So thank you very much, I move to the next speaker. Started the timer where you're gonna gong me off. Okay, no slides. That's fine. The slides just say who we are. And um, I'm Zuko, and I'm the CEO of the Zcash company. Zcash is uh, is zero cash that you've heard about earlier today, and um, uh, the rest of the. There's a whole bunch of other awesome people in the company, but I don't have time to explain it all, and that's what was on the slide. Um, so what we're doing is we're we're making zero cash, which is the best cryptographic protocol for privacy in a Bitcoin-like blockchain. And the reason we're doing this is threefold. First of all, privacy is necessary for fungibility, which is an essential component of anything that can be used for money. 
Second of all, privacy makes us as individuals and as societies stronger and safer and more prosperous. And thirdly, we're doing this because we believe that privacy is a human right. And the, uh, the next steps on this project, so MIDARS versus uh, part of our team uh, who presented about zero knowledge proofs this morning, which uh, caused my head to explode. Uh, oh yeah, I have slides. Um, that's my whole slide. Um, so we've already done, like, like Matt has talked about, there's been uh, decades, depending on how you measure, of cryptographic research. And uh, the next steps in this project are to deploy an altcoin with zero cash protocol in it. Um, and it's, there are various ways that it m is potentially possible to integrate zero cash with B the Bitcoin blockchain proper in the future, but that's gonna be future steps because we can't do that today. And uh, what we have accomplished so far in, in, in secret, in, in stealth mode, is uh, um, an implementation of zero cash in a fork of Bitcoin D and um, a test net. And so you can contact me at that email address and um, I'll give you access to the test net and the source code under an open source license. Um, but I'm just inviting you to do this uh, right now. We still don't have like a website or uh, any publicity or anything yet, but um, so, uh, so I'm, I'm asking you not to uh, make too much publicity about it, but contact me and, and offer to help because we want, um, developers to understand how to, you know, integrate um, the zero cash protocol with their, um, with their own software and uh, users who have feedback about the behavior or the performance of the system. And I can't take questions and I, I still have three minutes or two minutes before she drags me off. So, um, I think that covers everything that I think was most important. Who we are and why we're doing it because we think it's really important and that we want your help and that you can help by emailing me. Okay, thanks. Hello. Hi, I'm, I'm Corey Fields. I'm a core dev. Um, I just wanted to briefly speak about something I've been working on. I, I introduced the idea in Montreal. I wanted to give a, a brief update. Um, so I've been working on a, a kind of reworking of the, of the current networking stack inside of Bitcoin Core and, and working to modularize it and kind of contain it and get it, get it to the point where we could um, experiment with it in interesting ways. So. Uh, for, for, for the last few months, I've, I've been working on, on moving that stuff out into a separate library and integrating that library in, into Bitcoin Core as its, as its first and, and primary implementation. So as, as of a few days ago, I was able to actually get, get Core up and running um, with, with the new code, with the new stack that's, that's very ambiguous. Uh, I, I, real, I, I don't have the, the, the time to get into exactly what the, the differences are, but um, it allows for lots of interesting uh, experimentation and testing, uh, playing with, with new, you know, uh, adding, adding say, a, a new peer-to-peer -peer protocol on the side and playing with it, kind of like we have, we have Testnet now, a new testing peer-to-peer -peer protocol, just the ability, kind of, kind of a, a, a playground. So I'll be here for, for the next few days. I hope you guys will um, join me. I'm, I'm hoping to kind of show it off and get some thoughts and ideas on Tuesday and Wednesday at the at the Dev Meetup. So I hope to see some of you there. Hi, my name is Ryan Grant, and I made this spreadsheet because I haven't seen this presented visually before. Um, and here's what I mean. Uh, the spreadsheet is designed to draw your eye towards the two red columns, and the first red column shows uh, 
Adam, the concept of the frustrated users. The second red column shows uh, the concept of frustrated bandwidth. Um, the entire basis is uh, user growth, which is one of the variables. And I just put it all together and uh, it shows you that if users are growing at an unconstrained rate, then something like BIP 103, which is focused on technology and bandwidth, will show you some uh, some lost users in the in the red column. I'm sorry that this is not clearly on screen. So um, down at the bottom, there's a little um, there's a little URL which. Uh, Links, it's C8, capital I, capital Y, W, capital W, B, little b. Um, I'll put the whole spreadsheet up at that link in a few minutes. Um, oh, interesting. Can I do that? <laughs> oh, I can. Cool. <laughs> All right, so what what am I trying to get across here? Um, there's two kinds of, of ways to make your money worth more. There's money that's worth more for attracting new users through low fees, and there's money that retains its worth through easier decentralization, which protects financial ind independence. Um, my thesis is that ultimate financial independence relies on the number of full validating nodes, much more than the number of mining pools because there should be many more validating nodes and they should be in households which are harder to control than businesses. So if you're not worried at all about decentralization, then you're gonna focus on the, I'm not good at this, the green column um, where you users are growing as fast as they discover Bitcoin. And then you'll see uh, if, a, if you compare this with BIP 103, for instance, which is concerned with technological growth, um, there will be contention beyond uh, some basic number of transactions that a user can make. And so this is one of the variables of, I, I don't know if this is a net benefit. Um, uh, there's some variables, I'm assuming 24 transactions a year. This is all. This is all very rough in the style of Fermi estimations. I'll put a, a nice document explaining all of it online with a link. See you later. Hello, uh, my name is Bayrov Maxim. Uh, I pro uh, provide BitApps project, we from Russia. Uh, uh, we create the concept of Bitcoin wallet uh, uh, security. Uh, mostly people uh, first uh, use the desktop Bitcoin wallet and uh, you can get uh, some, some problems uh, with uh, uh, low disk space because uh, base every day is uh, grow up. Uh, then uh, when you go to traveling, return and uh, try to synchronize, you need to wait. Uh, and uh, most people uh, go to the online wallets, uh, but it have problems and fails too. Everybody have fails. Uh, for <laughs> For example, um, blockchain info is not working one, two days, then work week, then turn off for maintenance, and another. What we can do? Uh, uh, we can uh, use blockchain API services providers. It's uh, not use disk space, uh, no wait for synchronization, and uh, it's easy. Uh, you always uh, can get your uh, Bitcoin address balance, uh, you can uh, create transaction and then translate it uh, to the network. Uh, 
uh, but uh, if uh, this a API service uh, will be go to offline, uh, you can lose your money. Uh, and you need to use uh, any uh, available blockchain API services. Uh, then you can store wallet, reserve copy uh, in the blockchain network. Uh, it's uh, independence uh, from the physical device. Uh, sometimes uh, hard drive broke and you can lose your uh, private keys. Uh, we, uh, we, uh, we would like to propose to store wallet uh, in the blockchain network. Uh, user uh, create uh, have email password uh, and the second password like uh, blockchain password. Uh, we propose to uh, create it uh, via a script uh, algorithm and uh, uh, get creation password. Uh, then uh, we create uh, create uh, location in the blockchain network uh, and. Uh, and, and encrypt uh, your private key and uh, translate to the Bitcoin network uh, on the uh, um, exact address, its generated address. Uh, and uh, you can always use the uh, service via uh, API uh, um, to see your balance uh, and translate your transactions. Uh, but if our service uh, will be broken, uh, you always open desktop uh, software or mobile software uh, and uh, enter second uh, Bitcoin uh, password, blockchain password. Uh, then the software uh, open uh, this operating transaction from network. Uh, the code, uh, your private key, and uh, you will have the private key on your software. And you can use your uh, wallet at any time. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please do not hesitate and contact us via email. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Jonathan Hope. I am founder and executive director of Three Key Solutions. Um, I should say, uh, for clarity, Three Key Solutions should not be confused with Third Key Solutions, uh, with all due respect to Andreas. Um, and so I'm going to talk about optimal uh, unspent transaction selection. Okay. So one, one morning this year, uh, in spring, I woke up and saw my, my Twitter feed, a a link to a blog written by uh, Jameson uh, Lopp, who, who's here, and he talked about um, the factors that are relevant to optimal unspent um, transaction selection. And at the end of the blog, I realized, hey, I can solve this problem because I've been solving this problem for financial firms over you know, the last four or five years. Okay, and here's the problem. So how do you construct a transaction optimally so that the, um, you choose a s subset of the unspent transactions so that you reach an obje objective function? The objective could be enhance privacy, or it could be minimizing the tra transaction fee and so forth, okay? Well, it turns out that th this problem is um, a variant of the knapsack problem. Uh, knapsack, uh, as everyone knows, is MP complete. Uh, but as it happens, uh, the knapsack problem is one of the, relatively, relatively speaking, the most easy to, in practice, to, to solve of, of the MP compl uh, complete problems. And the variant that uh, was in the blog uh, mentioned by, by uh, LOP was, was actually APX complete, meaning that it cannot be approximated within a constant factor unless P equals NP, NP. So it's a non-trivial problem. However, in practice, we can solve it. Okay, so the current approach that's written in the um, Bitcoin source, uh, source code is that it uses a randomized heuristic to, to, to basically uh, achieve an objective of uh, minimizing the change um, that is generated when you construct a, a transaction. Well, that's fine for most people. Um, some users and some companies need have stronger requirements. Uh, for example, privacy. You don't want to. You want to choose uh, unspent outputs that are related to the same keys that are sent to the same address. Because if you 
if you don't do that, if you sort of bleed into other keys, you will leak information onto the blockchain uh, about the, 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 the link between those, those addresses. Likewise, um, companies um, that create lots of transactions, you know, exchanges, online gaming services, mixing services, and so forth, also want to minimize the transaction fees that they generate when they select the outputs. Okay, so, so we're talking about a new set of requirements here. Okay, so our contribution is that we've implemented a scalable implementation of the solution to this problem. It's written in C. We have implement implementations both in C and Python, um, and we have uh, configurations that are both as a library and a server. And we use techniques that are normally used to solve these problems, dynamic programming, variable reduction, branch and bound uh, search techniques, scaling, and in the case of the sort of more industrial strength version, um, we use multi-threading. Okay, so, so everyone recognizes this is the definition of the knapsack problem. Okay, you want to optimize. It's, it's a combinatorial search problem where you search for all pos possible combinations and you choose the one that, that gives you the, the, maximi the, the maximum uh, value. And this is what the optimal unspent transaction selection problem looks like. It's very similar in form, except for the function that we're trying to maximize is a linear combination of um, multiple other factors. Okay. Some of those factors can be the priority measure of the, outsp the output, it can be the value, it can be the size of the corresponding uh, input, and so forth. Okay, okay so in general, um, like I said, it's a generalized framework, so we can build and we can plug in arbitrary objective functions as long as they meet these constraints here, and basically that means that it's a monotonically growing function in the, the subset size, okay? And here's an example, for example. If we want to um, optimize for efficiency, well, we define f such that it, it, it considers the priority and sort of a negative weight of the transaction size. And likewise, if you want to maximize privacy, well, you choose a, f a function f so that it will increase the value of the function as long as there does not exist another unspent transaction that is using the, the same address and so forth. Okay. The point here is that all of these different objectives can be met by simply substituting a different function into a knapsack solver um, that solves the same problem. Okay. okay, so the current status is that a generic exact optimization engine exists. Uh, the next steps, I'd like to integrate this with a, a real big coin wallet, um, add real-time limits uh, so that you can specify, uh, I want you to optimize for five seconds and give me the best result that you can find in five seconds. Uh, and then I want to prove the value of the technology. So um, if anyone's interested in this, I would like to hear from you um, more factors that would be valuable to, me, to you, and that would help me sort of, um, sort of build in the future some um, different objective functions and so forth. So with that, I want to say thank you, and uh, here's my email address. Hello, uh, I'm Stan, uh, engineer at Kaiko.com. So what we do is so how does it work? Okay. So what we do is uh, we um, want to be the ultimate data source for uh, Bitcoin prices, exchanges, and blockchain data. Uh, we think that there's right now all of this data is uh, spread out on a variety of sources. Uh, and it's quite complicated to get get everything. Uh, sometimes you have a good website, sometimes you have a good API, sometimes you have financial markets data, sometimes you have blockchain data. So we want to have all of it, and we actually are, we actually have collected most of the basic data and now are now working on uh, productizing intelligence on top of it. Uh, so one thing we have is we have the, our price index, which to my knowledge is the first index to incorporate uh, trades from uh, Chinese and European exchanges. Uh, when you know that Chinese exchanges actually account for 95% of the volume today, it's quite weird to not include them. So this is one thing that we that we do. Um, we also have uh, we also store all the order books uh, snapshots every year, so that you can go back in time to see how they evolve and do cool uh, visualizations like this uh, in different uh, cuts. Uh, of the order books, so I can't really wait to, to see what uh, what kind of technical uh, analysis voodoo comes out of it. Um, uh, we want, this is another ex another example of uh, things we do. Uh, it's a live uh, chart of the blockchain uh, latest box, so that you can see uh, you can have a real time picture of what's going on. Um, 
we have a graph of the usage of Bitcoin, um, Bitcoin digital assets so that you can uh, follow and monitor adoption of these meta protocols. And uh, this is another example of uh, mining pool market share history over a few months. And well, we have a bunch of other statistics. So basically what I'm saying is we have a lot of data. Uh, if this interests you or if you are interested in other data, come talk to us. We are, um, we're hiring and we're uh, open to talking about everything uh, concerning uh, Bitcoin data. We're uh, based in Paris, which is the city of lights and love. So uh, if this interests you, uh, it's a good opportunity to visit Paris. And we're also open to remote work. Thank you. Maybe we should turn the air conditioning on in this room. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, so my name is Paul Stortz, and I'm, I'm working on kind of a lot of things at once, so I'm just going to mention three of them, and then I'm going to give some contact information. So if you're interested in any of them, that would be, uh, help would be great, and it might look great on your resume. Uh, who knows? So the first thing I'm going to talk about is uh, my project Bitcoin Hive Mind, which was until recently known as Truthcoin. Uh, Andrew Polstra and Peter Todd, who both spoke earlier today, they reviewed it, so you can talk to them if you want some third-party comments. And Roger Veer described it as possibly the most important project since Bitcoin. So it, it's a peer-to-peer -peer oracle system, so it's designed to get accurate, usable data into a, a block, the Bitcoin blockchain or a blockchain connected to Bitcoin, but only if that data is true. So uh, that's a lot harder than just putting whatever you want in there. So the second thing is uh, this thing drive chain that I wrote, which is a two-way peg proposal. It's very concrete. So unlike what was done by Blockstream, it's just, which is sort of like a, a big menu of kind of different things. This is like one specific thing. Um, and side chains enable people to do a lot of cool things, which include uh, scalability that's soft fork only. So it's like we don't need to go through this complicated process of the contentious hard fork uh, to kind of achieve scalability. So that's a cool thing. And then the third thing is I'm actually doing a, uh, I'm doing like a little survey of what people think the block size limit is for because there are at least four different points of view so far that I've noticed and I think that there may be even more. And if we can't even agree on what it's for, then we have, we stand absolutely no chance of calculating what the correct number should be. So. I'm going to mostly be emailing people about that, but I wanted to mention it in case anyone's interested in when I eventually compile uh, the results. So yeah, so my name is Paul Stortz, and my most uh, f sort of famous website is truthcoin.info. That's the most popular one. And my most popular tw Twitter is at truthcoin. So, so those are just some things that, I, that I'm working on. So, that, so if anyone would like to help or is interested, um, I'm here and I'm happy to talk to anyone about just about anything. So thank you. <laughs> so I thought I'd, um, I know Mark Friedenbach mentioned this earlier as well, talk about one potential way of achieving consensus that isn't proof of work. And uh, yes, I'm going to talk about proof of stake, although in a very, very narrow context, which is when you go think about it, Bitcoin miners can always reduce the block size. You know, nothing forces them to go and mine transactions. And even if we tried, there are so many different ways that they could use to get around this. So we have to accept that things like BFP one, um, 100 can exist, probably will exist, and there's nothing we can do about it. The interesting thing is in the reverse direction, can users go and prevent a block size increase? The answer is sort of a tentative yes, which is in the theory that users have some economic control. And of course, if they go around full nodes, they can go and say, I will not accept that block. And in theory, although I think this is a very nuanced kind of question, in theory, they have some control over the system in that way. I think maybe a more pragmatic answer is to go say, I think everyone in this room would like whatever decision comes out to have an air of legitimacy around it. Um, you know, the comments earlier, 
I think from some of the miners, you know, you could certainly perceive some of them as being, well, we're in control of the system. And I think some people would be kind of worried about that. And I think it's better off for Bitcoin if it's clear that control is distributed among many different ways. And one of the interesting things you can do there is proof of stake voting. Long story short, if I own coins, I can go and register my opinion about anything really, block size is an obvious one, by signing a transaction, setting a bit to represent some flags, say I want the block size limit to increase or decrease or so on. And when it ends up in the blockchain, that can be counted and that can uh, contribute back to the consensus. What's interesting there, of course, is when you look in the details, it gets a little fuzzy how you'd actually do it. Uh, miners, of course, can go censor votes. Uh, if I don't vote the right way, they can prevent a vote from getting in. But fortunately, in some models, this is actually something where the vote is two-sided, as in miners can make the limit go down, users, in theory, can prevent the limit from going up. And we can go provide a model where essentially the users go prove that they gave consent for block size increase, and miners can go and make it smaller, whatever they want. You know, would you actually implement such a system? That's a very complex question, but when it comes to, say, pushing through a change, something that may be worthwhile is to go say, look, in addition to this minor vote, we're going to go show that a certain percentage of the economic coins out there have gone and said, yes, I agree to this change, I will adopt it too. And that's actually fairly easy to implement. Um, in transactions, we have a field called end sequence which is for every input, we essentially have this free free floating field that can do whatever you want, such as say, set a bit saying, yes, I agree to this change. Should we do this? I don't know, good question. You know, I think optics actually matters a lot with this and I think it's worth considering showing very clearly to the rest of the world, you know, we did something with full consensus. Not that we did something with full consensus on people who could come to the stage or people could spend a lot of time on Reddit or Twitter, but rather we did full consensus among the entirety of coin owners. You know, and I'll point out, for instance, uh, one of my friends is CEO of uh, Case Wallet. I asked her, well, all right, where did you go ship your, your orders? And somewhat surprisingly to me, she said that about, I think about two thirds or so, went to countries that didn't speak English. You know, countries that weren't in the Western world. There's probably a big chunk of the Bitcoin space that's not participating in a lot of these discussions. You know, we don't really know what opinions they have. For all we know, we could be in a situation where we're walking into a scenario. You know, we're walking into a change that gets rejected because of people whose voice wasn't heard. You know, we don't necessarily have good solutions in a decentralized system, but this is potentially a way to let that voice be heard. So thank you. I'm Jesse Powell, co-founder and CEO of Kraken. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about a little side project that I had uh, with a friend called Elephant Grass. And uh, can you get the, uh, the slide up on here? Coming up, okay. Uh, so Elephant Grass, obviously uh, inspired by Magic the Gathering because why not just continue that trend in Bitcoin? Uh, so. So this is about some, some lessons I learned from um, essentially trying to implement a, a Bitcoin powered challenge response uh, spam filter uh, on my Gmail account. Um, and so this was done with a friend, uh, Tim White, the GitHub link is down there, it's all open source. Uh, so my problem was, is basically that uh, not, just, not just general unsolicited spam uh, or untargeted spam, but uh, probably many of you has, have the same problem if you're the CEO of a Bitcoin company or maybe the CEO of any company. You're just getting spam from guys, like very targeted spam with, with subject lines like Wednesday at 3 p.m. And I'm like, oh shit, did I, did I forget about this meeting with this guy? And then I open his mail and, and he wants to sell me some crap. Uh, and so I, I have a problem with this. I get, I get like tens to 20 you know, of these emails a day with some, some guy trying to sell me something and it's targeted and it's not caught by the spam filters. Uh, so what do I do about that? So make them pay uh, was the answer. <laughs> and uh, the only way I could think of um, that was legal was uh, to, to try to whitelist my contacts 
and then make anybody else who's sending me mail, who's not in my contacts, pay me uh, just some nominal amount of Bitcoin, just to, just to show me that they took a little bit of effort to do it. Uh, and of course, if, if you're very popular, uh, if you're Kim Kardashian, maybe you make that five Bitcoin. Uh, so the way that Elephant Grass works is uh, it's, it's a Google app script. Um, you just plug it into your Gmail account. No third party uh, needs access to your email or anything like that. And what it does is if the sender is not in your contacts, it filters it to another folder and auto replies with a payment request. And if that request is received, uh, or if the payment's received, then it moves that message into another folder, payment complete. Uh, so when I proposed this, uh, people were outraged. Uh, Jamie Zawinski of, of Netscape fame was especially outraged uh, when he got my auto reply uh, to, <laughs> to the newsletter for uh, the DNA Lounge in San Francisco. So you, know, you can see his enthusiasm uh, in his comment. And uh, I replied to him. I was like, you know, that's not very nice. And uh, he wrote back, and uh, you know, he, he clarified uh, his enthusiasm. So he, uh, he was actually helpful. <laughs> so he told me where to, where to look, right? Uh, this is what's wrong. So. Uh, so I did go check that out, and, and he was actually right. You know, like people have been trying to solve this problem uh, for a long time, and um, Elephant Grass actually did solve some of these issues. Uh, but the the ones that I got hit with were uh, this number eight and nine here. So uh, the potential integration into spam email harvest systems. So what I was doing when I was responding to all these unsolicited messages uh, was basically confirming for them that this email address is good, somebody's looking at it, uh, please continue adding this to your spam list and uh, send me more spam. Uh, in doing so, so the, the other problem is that spammers are sending you mail from spoofed addresses. And so I was replying back with like hundreds of messages a day to, to email accounts that had never actually even sent me anything. So now my address is getting, is, is looking like it's <laughs> spamming everybody, right? Uh, so, so it didn't really work out, um, and uh, you know the results are this: basically, uh, Google Apps Script. You have you have a limited amount of processing time uh, that you can use a day, and uh, this was just from the other day or from today. I've I've gone over 320, uh, you know, incidents of, of going over time. So I'm obviously getting a ton of spam now, uh, way more spam than I got before. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, so now, now I've got to, instead of looking through my spam folder, I've got to look through my payment pending folder uh, to see if anybody, you know, my aunt or whoever uh, sent me an email, wasn't on my contact list, and uh, now she's stuck in there. And this folder has like 10 times the amount of mail that my spam folder has. Uh, but, you know, it's still, it's still useful for one thing. I, I think that Gmail, unfortunately, doesn't have any way natively to filter on contacts. Uh, strangely, um, so you can actually disable the the payment request function in Elephant Grass and still use it for just filtering uh, the mail to another folder without replying. Uh, so this is actually, um, you know, one thing. This is like the best thing that came out of this whole thing was somehow my personal email. I had no idea how this happened. Uh, got got into the Ashley Madison uh, database. So and uh, so this guy emails me and he's like, hey. Uh, you know, I can, um, I'll protect all your information if you send me a Bitcoin. And uh, fortunately, um, the autoresponder sent him back a message saying, hey, you need to pay me like 0.005 Bitcoin <laughs> to even read your message. Uh, and I didn't get the Bitcoin. Fortunately, uh, like a couple days later, somebody else uh, offered to protect my information for half a Bitcoin. Uh, and I, of course, took him up on that. Uh, so next steps. Uh, well, you know, I think to really pull this off, we need the cooperation of the mail service providers. Uh, you know, really, this should be done by by Google um, within Gmail itself, and, and not at the end user level. Uh, and you know, might give us a reason to actually use Google Wallet. Uh, but I think somebody, you know, apart from that, what uh, what people told me that they found frustrating was 
look, dude, I'm trying to send you like half a penny and it's actually a hassle for me to send you that amount of money. Like I wish that this just happened automatically. Like I could load my browser with like 10 bucks and it would just do this automatically. So, um, and I, I think that that is the same would be said for uh, advertisements. If you wanted to ad block uh, and instead pay Bitcoin or instead of um, you know paying 25 cents every time you want to read an article on the Wall Street Journal, um, that this would just automatically debit and you could you know whitelist certain websites to debit up to up to a dollar a day from you or whatever. So there's obviously a, a need for that um, more broadly. Uh, and then of course uh, I have to create a new email address now because that one's toast. Uh, so uh, that's it for me. I guess I'm right on time. Thanks. Hi. Hello. My name is Sergio Ruocco. I'm uh, an Italian, but I'm actually living and working in Singapore. And I took just two minutes here to say that since I work as a scientist, as a researcher in uh, uh, Data Storage Institute of uh, ASTAR, so we are interested in anything that has to do with data center, data storage, uh, storage technologies, non-volatile memory, whatnot, and of course big data analytics and so on. I was wondering if anyone in the audience is interested to have a chat about research opportunities, research interest, or I don't know, collaborations and so on, because you know, uh, beside the research side, Singapore is quite active on the finance, just like Hong Kong. And recently, the prime minister advised banks to look at blockchain. You can Google prime minister Singapore blockchain. You will find this address to the banks. So I think Singapore should something that uh, also for entrepreneurs, not only researchers, should be a target for your interest. So if anyone is interested, just contact me and uh, we have like a chat over dinner, something like that. Second thing, if I have uh, 20 seconds, I just piggyback on the last speaker, this idea of charging uh, micropayments on uh, digital content, like visiting a page, reading an article and so on. I remember me, uh, this was two or three years ago, maybe a startup from the Northern Europe that was launched to solve the problem of um, payment of for digital usage. And the uh, neat idea they had is that every user set a monthly amount that they are available to spend, like you know, $10, $20, $30. And then whatever I mean, website you visit, this amount is uh, divided among the website. So it's not up to you or up to them to say how much you should pay, but it's your budget that is spread across all the content we are using. Of course, this needs to be evaluated, but I think that is something worth watching as a nice killer application for Bitcoin because it's very fine grained. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Good evening, how are you all doing? This has been a great conference. I, wanna, I want to thank everybody uh, that put this thing together. All, and I know there's a lot of people involved and I'm so terrible at names, I couldn't name a one of them. Um, but they've done a great job and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all. I'm Paul Snow, I'm the architect of a protocol called Factum. And uh, we're creating a general purpose data layer that sits on top of the blockchain, uh, the Bitcoin blockchain. The idea is to look at everyone uh, that wants to put the, a picture of their cat on the blockchain, everyone that wants to put a birth certificate on the blockchain, everyone that wants to fact uh, uh, that wants to uh, secure land titles or secure uh, a asset trading or any of that, all these meta protocols that have nothing to do with Bitcoin, but all of them want the security of 600 billion petahashes per second uh, that Bitcoin provides. Isn't in, in that about right? Close, Close enough. Um, and so, the, so the, the idea is to create a mechanism that anyone can access that um, security and record data and have it 
uh, created, uh, placed in a Merkle tree and placed that Merkle root into Bitcoin at uh, one hash uh, every 10 minutes for a total that's somewhat less than 13 megabytes per year, but has no limits essentially on the other side. So the weight of factum on Bitcoin is about 13 megabytes per year. The amount of data that you could place into factum per year could run in the terabytes. It really isn't that limited. Um, it also allows uh, the user uh, to have a nice API to place that data into factum and, um, and provide the uh, Merkle proof to that data in the Bitcoin blockchain. So um, protocols like, you know, Counterparty, OmniWallet, um, color coins, um, all kinds of asset trading. Instead of trying to figure out a way to encode that in some sort of nifty or sometimes uh, strange way uh, so that it fits inside of the Bitcoin protocol, you get to actually just place data into a record that goes into a Merkle tree and is placed into uh, the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, factum, right now, where, where are we at? We've got the protocol up and running. It's been running since September. Um, we are working towards a, um, a release candidate for the consensus model that will make the protocol uh, distributed. And um, later next year, we should get to the elections and identities so that uh, the users of the protocol can elect the servers that are running the protocol and make it a completely distributed autonomous thing. And then Peter Todd, when he wants to, uh, oh, no, I did not say, I said Peter Cottontail uh, wants to, <laughs> Peter Cottontail wants to know how many bunnies there are that want BIP 100 versus BIP 101. There is a way of recording all kinds of data against the Bitcoin blockchain, provable and distributed, and not grow the blockchain one iota, not require um, a bit to be changed or a byte or um, a nibble or whatever. Okay, um, that's pretty much Factum. If anybody has any questions about Factum and the protocol, um, I'll, I'll be here all week performing in the Caesar's Palace for your uh, enjoyment. Uh, next time I get a chance, I'll bring my juggling clubs and we'll have some good time. All right, thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Corne Ploy and I'm uh, working on Amico Pay, which is essentially uh, an implementation of the, the uh, Lightning Network. Um, and they, in the past couple of months, since uh, Montreal basically, um, um, I have been focused on uh, trying to achieve some uh, interoperability and uh, uh, standardization uh, for uh, all the different Lightning uh, imp implementations that are under construction. And I think there is something important that we need to focus on in, the, in that design. Um, that is, um, at, this, at some point in the future, there will be a release of, of Lightning software. And then people will start using it, creating a network. And uh, that network will have a, a, a network effect. It will become increasingly useful as uh, soon as uh, more people start using it. And then at a point in further into the future, you discover that, um, well, there is some feature that you would really like to have in a, in a network, but it has to be uh, introduced in an incompatible way. So the only way to introduce it is to create a new network. But that new network then has to compete with the old network. So it's kind of hard to introduce some new, some kinds of features uh, in the future. Um, so that will be a very similar situation as, for instance, the Internet Protocol version 6 uh, uh, introduction right now, which is going on for, what, about 20 years or so? I don't know. Um, so w w how can we... I, th I don't think we can completely prevent something like that from happening, but... Uh, um, it, it is something to, to, to focus on right now. Um, we can try to foresee uh, 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 things that we really want. Uh, uh, we cannot completely do that, I think. Uh, also, we can try to design it in an uh, extensible way so that in the future when we invent something new, it can be actually be introduced. 
Um, but then on the other hand, uh, uh, there, uh, um, I mean, if you think in this way, you there's the danger of bec becoming a perfectionist, right? And if you're, and perfectionism is the best way to never accomplish anything. Um, so there's a sort of a fine balance there. And I think even if you are a perfectionist, somebody else is not a perfectionist and will, <laughs> will launch his software first. Uh, so, um, um, yeah, w what is my con conclusion now? Uh, I think, uh, well, basically, it, it's, it's not a solution, my, my talk. My talk is more of uh, stating the problem and <laughs> making, making, uh, uh, creating some awareness of this. And, uh, well, maybe as a concrete proposal, we could uh, uh, make every design decision, uh, give it a category number, like this is category three network effects, or uh, which could mean uh, um, like uh, this only affects uh, uh, the link between two neighbors or something like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, th that's it. I think that is uh, what, what we as uh, Lightning uh, community need to do. And if uh, you have your own ideas about that, I would like to hear about it. Thank you. Uh, hi, miners. Um, how do you guys feel about orphan blocks? You guys like them? Hate them? Yeah, uh, so I, I had an idea a few days ago. Um, I'm probably not going to be able to implement it myself, but um, it might be able to help with this issue. Uh, basically, basically, the idea is that miners are not pools. Miners can choose between different pools. They can connect to via stratum to five, ten different pools uh, at the same time, and they can look at the first pool to inform them of the presence of a new block on the network, and they can switch mining to that new pool. They don't have to, s to stick with one pool all the time. Um, and if they do this, they can uh, reduce the orphan rate on both ends. They can reduce the, the frequency of uh, pools mining after a new block has been published on the old block, and they can also um, uh, promote the, the new block uh, uh, growing. Anyway, that's all. That's a quick idea. Hi, everybody. Uh, first of all, I'm really glad that everyone is still here and awake because it's been a long day. So thanks so much for kind of making it through the day. Um, so my name is Elizabeth Stark. I'm one of the organizers of this event. I'm also a co-founder of the startup behind Lightning with Joseph and Taj. They're somewhere. Hi, guys. Um, but I also was involved in organizing a patent workshop um, last month at Harvard Law School. So in the Bitcoin community, if some folks have noticed, there have been patents filed recently, both from within the uh, community, so say uh, Coinbase, I believe, filed some, and BitGo, but then also banks um, outside of the community had also filed patents. And given that this is an open source technology and an open protocol, if there are patents that could potentially affect the technology, that could be a major issue for the community as we move forward and as we scale. So quite a few of us got together and we had a discussion about what can be done together with Patrick Merck from the Berkman Center and Kat Walsh of Blockstream. And so we actually have a plan that's evolving. So if anybody's interested in the patent issue, please get in touch. Um, we're going to put out a pledge for companies and members of the communities that want to state that they're not going to assert their patents offensively. Um, we're going to work on a pool so that members can get together and we're going to find solutions around licensing and we're going to create greater resources for various patent offices. So far it's been mainly US oriented, but we'd love to have more of an international angle to this as well. So we're going to do uh, the second iteration of this meetup in California um, in January or February, and we're going to bring together members of the community that want to ensure that Bitcoin as an open protocol and technology does not get encumbered by patents. So uh, please get in touch if this is something of interest to you, and hopefully we can enable Bitcoin to scale um, from the legal side as well. Thanks. Okay, let's have one more round of applause for all of our work in progress speakers. And uh, so two quick announcements. Uh, the buses are gonna be leaving from the bottom of the escalators, I believe in this direction. Uh, they will get here at 6.30, so be down there by then to leave for the reception. And also you need to keep your badge. So you will need to have your badge to get into the reception. So uh, make sure that you have that. Thank you. So just to wrap up, um, 
Guess how many translation headsets we issued today? Eight. Eight. Yeah. Good guess. Higher or lower? Higher. How much higher? Fifteen? Higher. Twenty-five lower. Twenty-four. Twenty-one point three. Warm. Warm. How many? How many headsets? Given that this is a Bitcoin conference, come on. Hey, we got a winner. Right, so the buses are not leaving until I get 21 of these headsets <laughs> right back here. Because each of them, if they go missing, will cost us money. Okay. So, but seriously, though, no, there are 21 headsets and I do need them back for tomorrow. So tomorrow, um, tonight, you will need your badge to get into the venue. All right, we have a laser show at 8. It's on every night, so don't worry. Um, and it's going to be at a place called Hooray Bar. There are going to be four buses. The first bus will have a guide. I need three other helpers who are going to lead um, when we get off the bus to the actual venue itself. So, Leo, can you organize three helpers? Who knows where the Hooray Bar is? You need to separate one per bus, okay? Uh, I'll write the last one, so I'll take the last, uh, last one there. Um, now, tomorrow, you're going to all have to re-register, so we don't have to worry about this stuff.